Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed, Blessed be God's Lord, kingdom, now, now and forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to our Eucharist as today we celebrate the feast of our patron Paul and his co-apostle, St. Peter. For those of you who are visiting among us today, we would be uh, very pleased if you would join with us for refreshments following the service. And an invitation is open to all who would, uh, be, uh, who would like to receive the sacrament to join with us today at the Lord's table. My grace is sufficient for you, says the Lord, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us then run our race, lying aside every weight and bringing our sins to the Lord in penitence and faith. Merciful God, our maker, maker and, and our judge. judge. We, we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as our ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose apostles Peter and Paul glorified you in their deaths as in their lives, grant that your church, inspired by their teaching and example, and knit together in unity by your Spirit, may ever stand firm upon the one foundation your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you please be seated?
finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Pythias to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left for Tarsus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You all also must be aware of him, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and save me from his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very very truly, I I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and, and go to wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he he would glorify God. After this he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the feast of St. Barnabas, a somewhat overlooked apostle. Peter and Paul, today's saints of the day, on the other hand, are A-listers. So we might then wonder why they have to share a feast day like common or garden variety apostles such as Philip and James the Lesser. Well, the tradition reaching back to the earliest years of the church holds that Peter and Paul were martyred both in Rome on the 29th of June under the Emperor Nero. Now, the question is whether they were both martyred in 64 AD or in 64 AD and 67 AD, respectively. 
Peter, we know, was crucified upside down, and Paul beheaded by sword. Thus, since ancient times, they have been commemorated together. Breaking with this tradition, Edward VI's 1549 prototype would from the prayer ditch Paul, making June 29 exclusively St. Peter's Day. Well, after a 400 year trial, as so frequently happens, the merits of how things were done initially were rediscovered, and once again, Peter and Paul are fated conjointly. As with most pre modern saints, what we know of Peter and Paul is a launch of legend and history. Paul's decapitation has inspired several legends. According to one, his severed head rebounded three times, giving rise to a source of water wherever it landed. In a legend attributed to St. Hilary of Poitiers, when Paul was beheaded, his decapitated head said Jesus Christ 50 times. One assumes in glorification rather than profan profanation. And according to another legend, Rather than an outpouring of blood, Paul's wounds sp spurted out milk all over the executioner. <laughs> the jury is still out on precisely what this symbolises, yet we are assured in the golden legend that it led to much glorification of God by all who witnessed it. Paul's head seemed to keep working wonders for some time afterwards. St. Dionysius writes of a shepherd finding a skull and placing it up where his sheep grazed. For three nights running, a tremendous light shone upon the skull. Naturally, the local bishop and everyone else concluded this phenomenon meant that it must be Paul's head, which they then set about repatriating to his body. Praying before the apostolic bones they all believed their theory to be confirmed when the skeleton turned and joined itself back to the skull. I doubt that Paul himself would have tolerated legends of his bouncing, talking and luminous head, dismissing them in his customary manner as profane myths and old wives' tales. As for Peter, the line between legend and history is very blurry. It's claimed that Peter was the first Bishop of Rome and thus the first Pope. Problem is, all this stems from what is politely called tradition or more cynically referred to as myth. The thing is, there's no historical evidence that Peter was martyred in Rome, nor that he was Bishop of Rome let alone that there was even a papacy in the first century. In fact, there's no evidence that Peter ever even went to Rome. So that whole Peter was the first Pope thing seems to be a case of retrofitting provenance to support later developments. But what's interesting is that if Peter were the first Pope, then there's a good argument to be made that the first Pope was a married man. We know from the Gospels that Peter had a mother-in-law. Some, some try to brush this off, saying that by that time Peter was a widower. Two problems with that theory. First, if he were a widower, do we really believe that he'd still be hanging around his mother-in-law? <laughs> Second problem, in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul actually uses the example of Peter in a rhetorical question, which indicates that Mrs. St. Peter or Mrs. Pope Peter was still going strong. He writes, do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Kephas, being Peter? But I digress. 
I guess all of this merely serves to bring to us the realization that the reasons we co-celebrate Peter and Paul today are, to use the historian's technical term, dodgy. But isn't it so that if one persists with something dodgy for long enough, it is eventually ennobled as it acquires a patina of tradition and being of time immemorial? Now, clearly, apocryphal texts and legends, while somewhat amusing, aren't especially edifying. The scriptures, fortunately, provide us with sharper tools for profiling Paul and Peter. So let's begin with Peter, Prince of the Apostles. He leaps from the pages of the Gospels and Acts as impulsive, ambitious, outspoken, at times lacking strength of character, yielding to consensus and popular opinion, and with strong instincts of self-preservation, but also at times a readiness to reach for the sword. His eagerness to proclaim Jesus' messiahship stands in juxtaposition with his thrice denial of knowing Christ, which in turn stands in juxtaposition with his threefold affirmation of knowing Christ and loving him. We also know him to be a man of insight and leadership, shepherd of the early church, overseeing the replacement of Judas as an apostle and preaching at Pentecost, inspiring mass conversions. And he was also the first welcomer of a Gentile into the church, a man of miracles whose mere passing shadow could heal those upon whom it fell. And he was a man that would ultimately give everything of himself for Christ's sake. As for Paul, even at a distance of 2,000 years, through Acts again and his own epistles, we can know him sufficiently to form strong opinions about him. He appears as a Jekyll and Hyde-ish type character who seems plagued by contradictions and inconsistencies. An exemplar Jew, yet a proud Roman citizen. Pastoral and sensitive, yet manipulative, contentious, irritable and polemical. Generous, yet insistent and demanding. A man of great eloquence, an impressive preacher, yet also one who droned on for so long that he literally bored someone to death as they fell asleep and then fell out of a window. He was at times an elegant and poetic writer and at other times convoluted, laboured and opaque, flawed yet heroic. And we see Peter and Paul as very different sorts of men. Peter the fisherman, Paul the castaway. The literate, intellectual, educated and strongly opinionated and obstinate Paul standing in sharp relief to the modest, vacillating and oscillating Peter. Their ministries were oriented in very different directions. Peter the apostle to the Jews and Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. Yet they both held in common that they were unlikely candidates to be leading apostles. Peter, who had denied Jesus. Paul, who had persecuted the nascent church. Both also in common had name changes. Simon became Kephas, or Peter. Saul dropped his Jewish name to take up Paul, the Roman name. And both took up their cross and followed Christ, were held captive and martyred. I think a major takeaway for us today as we celebrate their feast is that people can 
and do change. Encountering Christ affects change in people. Paul transformed from a Peter transformed from a humble, fearful Galilean fisherman into the building block of the church, a man of leadership and authority. And Saul transformed from persecutor of disciples to the greatest missionary and builder of Christian communities that the church has ever known. Today's, today's puritanical cancel culture fails to understand this basic human possibility of change, instead preferring to write people off, disallowing that they may change, refusing to understand or forgive. A culture that has no belief in people's capacity to change or interest in people's rehabilitation or redemption lacks basic insight into humanity and is heartless. Thankfully, that is not God's economy. God doesn't require perfection of us. Rather, a new beginning, transformation, sanctification, renewal, spiritual growth. This is what God offers to those who are less than perfect. Those who seek to follow the way of Christ of discipleship, not cancelling us, but giving us new life, united, grafted into the life of Christ. When we speak of the encounter with Christ causing change in us, it's not just radical conversion experiences like that of Paul that I have in mind. It's the ongoing change within us, the daily consecration of our being, the remoulding of ourselves day by day into the likeness of Christ, into godliness, through the encounter of Christ in the scriptures, the sacraments and life of prayer, and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Something should be changing, growing and maturing as we make the daily pilgrimage of discipleship. The fruits of that change, that growth, are the fruits that Paul identifies as those of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, forbearance, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and faithfulness. Lives that are open to God change as they bear this fruit. I think of a friend whose life was in disarray, a drug addict who suffered from violence, trauma, poverty, and grief. She found faith in Christ in the midst of those circumstances and gradually experienced profound change in her life, finding healing, release, strength and hope, transitioning from junkie into priest. So let's ask something of ourselves. What in it? Our lives has changed by encountering Christ. What change do we feel the Holy Spirit is prompting us to make in our lives? What should be changing within us? And which of those fruits of the Spirit should be growing in the orchard of our inner self? Do we have the courage to accompany Christ into the terrain of self-reckoning, repentance and renewal? Do we really want him to guide us there and to carry us through it? I think another takeaway from Peter and Paul today 
is the centrality of sacrificial self-giving in the Christian life, taking up the cross and following, or in Pauline terms, dying to self and living to Christ. Childhood rector of mine frequently trotted out this line in sermons in a very headmastery voice. The symbol of Christianity is a cross, not a cushion. His point was, quite obviously, that the Christian life of discipleship is not one of comfort. If we're settled on the spiritual couch, comfortable and inert, then something's wrong. That may come as a shock to the Hillsong prosperity gospel crowd. While I doubt that any of us and hope that none of us will be called to martyrdom like Peter and Paul, that most extreme form of self-giving love, which draws us into the life of the kingdom, we too are nevertheless called to different forms of self-giving love, giving of ourselves to serve others, to serve God, to serve the church, even when we're busy, tired, time poor, or just not in the mood. It's responding to others when and as we find them. It is practicing forgiveness, it is finding the freedom and joy that come from generosity. It is to prioritise gathering with the people of God in worship, even on a cold Sunday morning when we're not rostered on for anything. It is to support the ministry of the church through prayer and generous giving. It is not only to seek the will of God, but it's to pursue it, even if that makes no sense to others or comes at a high cost. It is to give of our wealth and to surrender status and prestige, worldly pursuits and ambitions when the call of God asks us to take a different path. It is to give to God first and to give our brightest and best, not our leftover scraps and loose change. The journey of discipleship isn't a spiritual walk in the park. Lighting a scented candle, practicing mindfulness, and listening to New Age music while wearing active wear and sitting on a yoga mat or Swiss ball, it ain't. The way of discipleship is tough. Yet by giving up and letting go of all that impedes us in following Christ, we find ourselves operating in God's economy, not the world's. An economy where the value of things is measured by love and where the legacy is eternal. Our patron Paul exhorts the faithful, train yourselves in godliness, for godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Like Peter and Paul, may we experience change in ourselves through the grace of Christ, growing in godliness as we serve our God and his people. Saints Peter and Paul, pray for us. Amen. All that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only Son of God, Son told his disciples not to be afraid, and at Easter breathed on them his gift of peace. Look with mercy upon the world into which he sent them out, and give it that peace for which it longs. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your Son formed around him a company who were no longer servants but friends, and he called all those who obeyed him his brother and sister and mother. Look with mercy upon our families and friends and upon the communities in which we share. We pray today especially for our parish under the patronage of your Apostle Paul. We give thanks for our common life, our shared faith in Christ, the gifts of service and love that are offered here. Give us conviction as we look to the future of this parish and raised up among us a spirit of mission, service and generosity in our service of you, the world and the church. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. Your Son sent out disciples to preach and heal the sick. Look with mercy on all those who yearn to hear the good news of salvation and renew among your people the gifts of healing. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your Son promised to those who followed him that they would sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel and would share the banquet of the kingdom. According to your promise, look with mercy on those who have walked with Christ in this life and now have passed through death. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. So join us together in unity of spirit by their doctrine, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated and I invite our um, Mission in Action uh, team to come and make this morning's presentations. Today we celebrate NADOC Week, 
and on this occasion, on, on their suggestion, the Mission in Action team have started a Hall of Fame, which this year focuses on ind Indigenous leaders in our community. Two recipients, the Reverend Gloria Shipp and Helen McLaughlin, have been both inspiring in their work in Indigenous affairs and have links with our parish. Two years ago, we met Gloria via Zoom and learnt of her work and with predominantly Aboriginal communities. She has had a distinguished career doing God's work in the Dubbo area and we currently support her work through ABM. When contacted, Gloria was pleased and willing to be honoured in our Hall of Fame, but could not be uh, with us today saying, I quote, I am sorry I can't make it there. I have a service in Ningen that, that morning and I will watch it later. Helen McLaughlin, a member of this parish uh, reconciliation group is known to those who attended the 7am service pre-COVID. Helen is also known nationally and internationally for her work at senior levels on in Indigenous affairs. At first, Helen was reluctant for her story to be told, but as you will hear in a moment, her personal history is very interesting. Helen is here today with her son Robert and grandson Patrick. Uh, we, we thank Ben and Paul for their support with this initiative and for Gloria and Helen for agreeing to be part of it. Uh, we we uh, thank, we now uh, invite Catherine and Elizabeth to read the citation where you'll learn about these two women. Thank you. The Reverend Gloria Ship. Gloria is a Kamilari woman who was born in Ninga, New South Wales, and moved to Dubbo in the 1980s. She was ordained a deacon in 1994 after studying theology at the Kumlinglia Nunginglia. Helen, I have to ask you to say what <laughs> Nunginglia College in Darwin. She became the first female Aboriginal priest in 1996 and returned to the Diocese of Bathurst. There, she set up a walkabout ministry supported by the Anglican Board of Mission. Her ministry included chaplaincy to the Arana Juvenile Justice Centre in Dubbo. She is no longer chaplain, but maintains a close interest and involvement with the boys there. Gloria has been an honorary priest assistant in the Dubbo Parish. Each year, she organises a Christian rally in Dubbo a reconciliation luncheon, women of the Bible studies, camps for men, women and families, and outreach trips to other communities. An elders outreach group is held weekly, including craft, fellowship and guest speakers. Another part of the ministry is a bread run, delivering to families in need. This ministry has been extended from Dubbo to include Ningen and since 2021, Gloria has divided her time between Dubbo and Ningen. Gloria is a life member of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Anglican Council and its chairperson over many years. In 2022, Gloria was commissioned as a companion of the Company of the Good Shepherd. Each month, she ministers in the parish of Ningen, Warren and Coba, in turn, as each parish is cur currently without a parish priest. Gloria prefers the term partnership to the term reconciliation as it applies to her work. In her own words, if we want to understand, we must learn to listen. We need to learn to live together in Australia and learn about one another's culture by listening. The parish of Monica has helped to support Gloria and the walkabout ministries in Dubbo and Ningen through donations to the ABM over a number of years. Gloria has embraced the challenges of being a pioneer, being both indigenous and a woman seeking ordination in the Anglican Church. We admire her courage, empathy and perseverance and consider her a very worthy member of the Parish of Monica Hall of Fame.
Helen McLaughlin. Helen was a St Paul's parishioner who regularly attended the 7am service and was a member of the parish reconciliation group. Helen was not a member of the Stolen Generations, but many aspects of her story are very similar. Due to very sad circumstances, Helen's mother was not able to care for her and agreed that a non-Indigenous family whom she knew could adopt Helen and bring her up on their cattle station west of Mackay in Queensland. They were good and kind parents, but abided by the laws of the day governing adopted children. So Helen grew up without any knowledge of her Indigenous family heritage. Over the past 25 years through her research, Helen has discovered both her maternal Indigenous and paternal Anglo-Celtic heritage and has connected with many members from both sides of her family. Helen is an elder of the Kunyo people of the Warrigo River region around Kunmala in southwestern Queensland. On March the 22nd, 2022, the federal court granted the Kunya people their native title rights after a 26-year battle for recognition. The Kunya people are currently setting up a prescribed body corporate to administer their lands. During her career, Helen's focus was on the Indigenous policy development and the provision of advice at state, federal and international levels. Always a private and quiet achiever, Helen was at first reluctant to accept the offer of being in the Parish Hall of Fame. She felt that while her personal story is very interesting, it's not unusual for Indigenous Australians to have such a background. Helen has agreed to share her story as a tribute to the hardship and suffering of her many strong women ancestors of both Indigenous and Anglo-Celtic her heritage. Individually, these disparate women suffered many tragedies during the early years of the establishment of the state of Queensland. Fate inadvertently brought their families together in 1940, the year of Helen's birth. Their strength and determination, their courage and endurance are qualities that Helen inherited from them. And it is her belief that the resilience of these women forged her character and made her whom she is today. Clearly, Helen is a very worthy member of the parish, Manica, parish of Manica Hall of Fame. Thank you. Helen, it's a great pleasure to present this to you and uh, the larger-than-life version will be up on display, but this is, this is for you as a memento of today and the esteem in which you are held among us. So many congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Helen would like to say a couple of words. Firstly, I acknowledge and express my respect and admiration for all Indigenous Elders across the nation. Thank you to all who recommended me for this tribute. It was the greatest humility and reluctance that I accept this honour. As a former public servant, I work quietly behind the scenes in policy development, hoping to make a difference to people's lives. During my journey through life, particularly as an Indigenous woman, I was confronted by many personal challenges. In surmounting these obstacles, I hope that I set an example of what can be achieved by strength and resilience. 
My strength has been drawn from my female ancestors, a long line of strong women, both Indigenous and Anglo-Celtic, who lived their lives in the context of the appalling conditions of the frontier that existed in the outback of 19th century and early 20th century Queensland. Their struggles and the difficult conditions they endured and dealt with during their lives are unimaginable in today's world. In accepting this honour, I acknowledge all the strong and impressive women whose suffering and efforts contributed to the founding of the nation we know today. Thank you. Would you please stand? We are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Through Christ our Lord, who came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Father, accept all we bring before you this day. Guide us with your love and feed us at your table as you nourish the faith of the church by the preaching of your apostles, Peter and Paul. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for following the example of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, your holy apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul shed their blood for the glory of your name. Their deaths reveal your power made perfect in our, hu our frail humanity. You chose the weak and make them strong in bearing witness to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. With joyful hearts we echo on earth the song of the angels in heaven as they praise your glory without end.
merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took a cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ Christ will come come again. Therefore, living God, as we obey his command, we remember his life of obedience to you, his suffering and death, his resurrection and exaltation, and his promise to be with us forever. With this bread and this cup, we celebrate his saving death until he comes. Accept, we pray, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and send your Holy Spirit upon us and our celebration that all who eat and drink at this table may be strengthened by Christ's body and blood to serve you in the world. As one body and one holy people, may we proclaim the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord through whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, eternal God, now and forever. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. God, the source of all holiness, may we who have shared at this table be welcome as strangers and pilgrims on earth, be welcomed with Peter, Paul, and all your saints to the heavenly feast in your kingdom. Amen. Amen. It's been a longer service than normal today, and I'll try to keep the notices as punchy as I can. Uh, firstly, thanks to all who assisted with last Wednesday's community night. That was, uh, despite the foul weather, we had a wonderful turnout, and it was a, a lovely night, so thank you all. Uh, and thanks, too, for those who were involved in yesterday's working bee to fill the skip outside the hall. Um, that was very satisfying to get stuff and throw it in there. So um, thanks to those who helped. Um, I'm looking for, for people who would like to join the r roster as readers for our 9.30 service, um, just seeking a few extra people to be involved there. So if that appeals to you, please speak with me after the service. We have been uh, looking at uh, acquiring a defibrillator, which um, I have ordered now on trust that funds are going to magically appear. Uh, we had a very generous donation from one person uh, on Friday, which covers about half the cost, uh, uh, which is someone from our eight o'clock, con uh, seven thirty congregation. So I'd like to hope that our 9.30 congregation can uh, chip in as well. Um, so we're looking for another $1,500 towards that cost, and uh, it may be an investment that you uh, get dividends from one day. <laughs> so um, <laughs> um, there you go. Um, in our parish e news, there, are, there is information there about Christian initiation, uh, for baptism, first communion, and confirmation, both for children and adults. Uh, I commend that to you, and if you are interested, please speak with me or one of the other clergy. Uh, we have upcoming our dedication festival on the 6th of August, and our guest on that occasion will be Archbishop uh, Geoffrey Smith, who is the Archbishop of Adelaide and Primate of the Anglican Church of Australia. So he will be uh, our special guest and preacher on that occasion. You can book for the luncheon through our Eventbrite link in the parish e-news, or if you have trouble with that, uh, pop into the office and uh, someone will be able to assist you with that, I'm sure. Uh, bookings are limited to 100 adults, and so far I think we're nudging 50. Uh, so um, within the first week. So if you plan to come, make sure you get on and book quickly to avoid missing out. And uh, the number of children who can come isn't so restricted because part of yesterday's project was to clear the stage in the hall and that's where we're going to put them all. So um, we can squeeze quite a few of kids in there. So, and children are free uh, as well. Um, aside from thanking uh, our musicians, singers, and choristers for their um, wonderful contribution this morning, that is all I need to mention. So would you please stand for our final hymn?
God protect you from hobgoblins and foul fiends and give you grace to follow Peter, Paul and Mary and all the saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to... Um, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ.